Welcome back into our class, BI 440. This is the book of 1 John. We're studying the first the first John chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, the first book of John. This is our class, BI 440, and we want to take this opportunity to walk in all of our pastors from the 19 different countries. And now we have a group of pastors from Arkansas, Northern, Northern California, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So we're very, we're very grateful for all of you joining us in our class here. And we're, we're, we're going verse by verse, phrase by phrase phrase and sometimes we're going to be teaching word by word so that we get a better understanding of the profundity and the amplitude of the word of God here in first John so we're going to continue in our study so let me open ask you to open up your Bibles in first John and as you well know I teach out of the NASB version of the Bible the New American Standard Version and we have many dialects and many languages so follow along with me here in first John chapter 1 we're looking at the first five verses let's read what was from the beginning and what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we have proclaimed to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. In today's session, look, and as, we, as you well know, we continue to always answer and respond to questions that we're continually receiving here. And one of the issues that come is, is, the, is the following. What is the impact of spending time with Jesus? I repeat, what is the impact of spending time with Jesus? Now, all of us in this particular course are all pastors here, right? And one of the one of the one of the ongoing issues that you and I have to face in the pastorate and pastoring a church and dealing with the membership, dealing with people who call themselves believers, is how is the it is the incomprehensible. Let me put it this way. It is the incomprehensible percentage of believers who say they're believers and who sit in the church who spend very little time with Jesus. And as a result, you can tell the opposite is true. They have very, they, these believers, have very, very little impact on the world, very little impact in their neighborhood, very little impact with, very little impact with their families and with their friends and, and their co-workers and so forth. It's because they really have not spent enough time with Jesus and the impact screams out loud. The Apostle John comes to deal with this issue right at the beginning of this epistle. Immediately. So I want you to look at this. Now we read the first five verses, and we're going to go back, and we're going to teach and repeat, teach and repeat, teach and repeat, because you need to grasp. Okay, you need to grasp this idea. Okay, that so many of our people spend very little time with Jesus. So now, when we look at the writings of the Apostle John, because that's the author of First John. When we look at his writings, he deals with all three periods of time. He deals with all three periods of time. He deals with the past, he deals with the present, and he deals with the future. Now, the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, which portrays the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and he reveals to us, John, he reveals to us the matters about the past. That's really crucial, the matters about the past, okay? And he was very close to the Lord and loved, and he clearly loved Christ. Okay, he dearly loved Christ. In fact, Jesus himself demonstrated his confidence in the Apostle John by entrusting the care of his mother to him as he was dying on the cross of Calvary. You remember that. But he also wrote the book of, of the Bible. Okay, he also wrote he, John also wrote the last book of the Bible that we know as what as Revelation. Right, it's the book of Revelation. Which, give us, which gives us a glimpse into the future. Gives us a glimpse into the future, okay? And the catastrophic events that will take place during the seven-year tribulation, okay? the rise and the fall of the Antichrist, the defeat of Satan, and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth for all of eternity. So now, John, in 1 John, gives us, gives us, gives us a clear picture of the past, 
and he begins to give us a clear picture into the future, okay? But John also wrote, okay, three other letters known as the epistles of John. So in our Bible, they are listed as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, the three epistles of John are extremely important for us today. And you remember I talked to you about this in our first session. One of the things that I recommend to our pastors is that you teach through the gospel of John first. Teach through the gospel of John first. And now for the believers, I always encourage them, read through, study through okay, extensively the gospel of John. So by the time we get to 1 John, the picture is very, very clear for us. Okay, 1 John will in fact be a great source of encouragement okay to whom it's going to be encouragement to you if you're struggling in these particular areas for example if you struggle if you struggle in your fellowship with god or with other christians and let me tell you something, a lot of people in churches are struggling with that if you struggle in your relationship with god and other christians this book is going to help you okay secondly if you've lost the joy, if you've lost the joy of the Lord and you're way down and you're with discouragement, okay, this book is going to help you. Okay? If you're confused about sin and if sinful habits are taking, how would you, how would you say it, taking a toll, if they're taking a toll on all on your walk with God and your closeness with him, he reveals to us how to deal with sin. And then if, you, if you're having difficulty okay, with loving and caring for other Christians, this book is going to help you. If you doubt your salvation and God's forgiveness, this book is going to help you. If you are confused about the deity of Jesus Christ because of false teachers, this book is going to help you. If you struggle with a victorious Christian and consistently, um, and consistently, and consistently living the Christian life that pleases the Lord, this book is going to help you. If you have difficulty in discerning what is true and what is false, especially in spiritual matters, this book is going to help you. So you can begin to see the practical applications of First John in the life of the church. But you also must always establish first the theological and the technical aspects of the book first before you move into application. If you don't have a foundation, then application means nothing. So this letter is written to Christians, and it is a very, and, and for sure, it is very practical, okay? So let's dig in and see what treasures we can find within its, page, its, within its pages. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide this book, okay, the, in the first five verses, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. We're going to divide it in five major points, in five major points, so that we have a frame. We have, a, we have, we have this construction, construction framework by which we can hang our hat on, and we can begin to slowly work our way through this particular epistle. So here's how we're going to divide it. So write this down. Point number one, okay? Jesus Christ is all, ha, has always existed. Did you hear what I said? Point number one, Jesus Christ has always existed. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that we're going to teach through in verse one, okay? Point number two, <clears throat> Jesus Christ has proven who he is. He has proven who he is. Jesus Christ has proven who he is. That we're also going to study in verse one. Point number three, Jesus Christ has revealed who he is, the word of life. Jesus Christ has revealed who he is, the word of life. And that we're going to study in verses one and two in detail. Then point number four, Jesus Christ came to the earth for the most glorious purpose. Jesus Christ came to the earth for the most glorious purpose. That's point number that's point number four, and that's going to be in verses three and four. And then point number five. These are the five points that we're going to be working with. Here's point number five. Jesus Christ preached the most wonderful message man has ever heard. Jesus Christ preached the most wonderful message that man has ever heard. And that's going to be, we're going to study that out in verse five. So let's begin to get into the text here a little bit. And let's go, we're going to focus in on verse one. Point number one, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the eternal one. He is the pre-existent one. And Jesus Christ has always existed. This is the issue that the Apostle John begins to deal with. Why? Because of so many false teaching. Agnosticism had now come into the church. Atheism had come into the church. Syncretism had come into the church. All kinds of issues had come into the church. And this is at the very beginning of the church. 
Yeah, you need to remember that. So somewhere between 85 and 95 AD, then the church is still young. <clears throat> it's been birthed. Okay? And, and already the false teachers and the wolves have already invading in the church and had this church confused. Okay? So let's look at this. Look at, look at the Apostle John begins to establish a truth. This single truth is what everything else is predicated upon. Look at verse 1. What was from what? What was from what? What was from the beginning? Look at verse 1. He said, what was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen what, what with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Remember that the Apostle John hmm, is an eyewitness to who the person of Jesus Christ is. So, th so this is what's meant by the words, what was from the beginning. Jesus Christ was existing before the world was ever created. He was living and had always been living. He possessed life. He possessed the energy of life. He possessed the power of life. He possessed the he possessed the force of life. Okay, he was from the very he was from the he he was the very being, and the essence of life, and continues to be, the very embodiment of life. Life was wrapped up in him in the person of Jesus, for he was the very energy and the force of of life itself. And the Apostle John is the one who begins to detail this out for us and begins to establish it in a language with no uncertain terms. It amazes me all the time how we deal with modern day preachers and modern day uh, theologians, okay, who claim what something was and they weren't there 2,000 years ago. And yet here we have an eyewitness who is establishing the issues for us with great clarity. So I want you to think about this because I believe that the point is clear. The point is clear. From the beginning, Jesus Christ was already there. From the beginning, Jesus Christ was already there. Now, the reason we're going to start with this issue is because, if you remember when we did our Q&A session in 1 John, and when we asked you to develop the questions and so forth, and what was astonishing to me, it was, I didn't expect it, but I should have expected it, and that was that 28.5%, 28.5% of all the pastors who wrote back to us told us that they had in question, okay, because of what they heard from so-called apostles and prophets and other teachers in their communities around the world, and from what they heard from other people, okay, and that is that Jesus Christ was literally born and he never existed before. That's 28.5% of the pastors responded that they were not sure. Now you can begin to see what was from the beginning, as, as, the, as the Apostle John begins to lay out for us here. Look at verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now you understand that 2,000 plus years from the time of the writing of this epistle to, to today, it is still an issue to be dealt with. Okay? So the point is clear that from the beginning, Jesus Christ has all, was already there. He did not have a beginning. He he was not created. He was he was what was from the beginning. He was there. Our Lord and our Savior knows what the other world is all about. For he has come from there. He's come from the heavens. Therefore, all that he told us is true. We can trust his word. Now go back. Now let me ask you something. Hold your place in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, and go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. So go to John 1, 1, hold your place here in 1 John 1, 1. And here's what John is very consistent in what he's saying. He said in, in John chapter 1, 1 in the Gospel of John, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He made it very clear at the, at the, at the beginning of the, of the Gospel of John. Now, let's begin to see if we can, how would you say, if we can integrate Scripture with Scripture. Why? Because Scripture always interprets Scripture. My opinion and your opinion, to be honest with you, doesn't mean anything. Okay? But what does Scripture actually say? So let me hold your place there. And I ask you to hold your place in First John. Now, turn your Bible to the book of Psalm chapter 90. Psalm chapter 90. Look at this with me. Let's go to John, Psalm chapter 90. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth in, in the world, even from everlasting to heaven, and even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, this verse here, 
in Psalm chapter 90 verse 2 clearly, okay, annihilates the whole argument of evolution. You know, it, 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 that's very clear, okay. So we, we need to understand it, you know. He says, now hold your place there and, and I go to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 8 verse 23. And what we're doing is we're taking these verses to underpin, to undergird, to support, okay, the idea that what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have touched with our hands, that issue that the Apostle John is talking to us in 1 John chapter 1 verse 1, again, okay, is not predicated on some fleeting thought. But you can see that this truth of what was from the beginning is integrated throughout Scripture. Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23. And it says, from everlasting, I was established. Well, who's speaking? God. Well, who's God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? And so we know that God the Son, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, okay, the Son of God, okay, is God. And that, and that person of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, is the physical incarnation, the human flesh, the human form of God the Father in heaven. So he says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23, he says, From everlasting I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. Hmm? Now, go with me, go back to the Gospel of John, John chapter 17, please. John chapter 17, and Jesus makes a startling statement here in John chapter 17, verse 4. He says, John 17, 5, Now the Father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Before the world was. When you reject Jesus the Christ, you reject God the Father. That's clear. You reject the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now go with me to the book of Philippians. Now the Apostle Paul puts it another way. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, turn your Bibles to verse 6, 7, and 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, 7, and 8. Look at what he says here. He says, Who, although he existed in the form of God, who is who, although? Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, right? Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, okay? But emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance, in verse 8 he says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we can clearly see that something that was from the, that was before the beginning, that's Jesus Christ. Yeah? And you we see this just replete throughout scripture. Well, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Now, remember that my focus and my emphasis is that I'm directing myself to pastors, okay? To over 12,000 pastors that we're talking about. And in the course of that, we have just thousands of believers that are tuning in as well. And But I want you to understand that if we don't get this right, if we don't understand this right, don't expect the church to get it right. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he says this. The Apostle Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through that though he was rich, a reference to when he was in heaven, yet for your sake he became poor, he came down to heaven, so that you so that you through his poverty might become rich. Okay? Now, so go back to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. And let's go all the way back there. And I want you to see this, okay? And, and and what are we doing? One of the things that we're doing in this particular course is that we're going through this painstakingly slow. Painstakingly slow because we need to get this right. We need to get this right. It amazes me for all the education that we have, for all the titles that we have, all the degrees that we have, how we miss the issues that are so simple and complex at the same time in the Scriptures. But God makes himself clear through through his writing and through the person of the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. And the Apostle John says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, the, now we come to the, this is a message of redemption. 
a message of redemption. It is unchanging. The message of redemption is unchanging. It has never changed. Now, either you accept scriptures or you reject scripture, but you nor I, none of us have the authority to change scripture. So the message of redemption is unchanging. You teach, you repeat, you preach, and you repeat, you teach, you repeat, you preach, you repeat, and we keep saying the same thing over and over again. Why? Because the message of redemption is unchanging. From the beginning, the, from the beginning of the proclamation of the gospel, it has been the same. I have no idea where you get the idea that you can change the gospel message. It's beyond my comprehension. Maybe I'm not that smart. So those who preach, and that's everybody here, right? Those who preach the true gospel have always commanded faith and repentance. Faith. And repent. Let me show you this. Turn your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. And what we're doing in this particular class is that we're integrating, okay, the truths that are found in 1 John chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, into the rest of the scriptures, okay, in the Old Testament and New Testament, to show you that what Apostle John is teaching is not some isolated idea. In the first, I ask you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So you can see that, that everybody that's preaching here is preaching faith and repentance. Faith, in, they're commanding this. It's not a suggestion, not a recommendation. John, go, go to the Gospel of John chapter 3. And the Gospel of John chapter 3. Look at verse 16, 17, and 18. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, 17, 18, and he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him, he says, shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, that verse is well known and stepped on all over the world. But look at verse 17 and 18. In verse 17 and 18, he says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So the message of redemption has not changed. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. The Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter, he's preaching away. And look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is the day of the birth of the church. And Peter says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. He says, Peter said to them, Repent. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is what? Salvation. Hmm? So the message of the redemption has not changed. Stay with me in the book of Acts. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, verse 30. I repeat, Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And he says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should do what? Should repent. Should repent. Hmm? And so I want us to understand this, and I want to repeat this painfully slow and, re and, and often, because we have, as pastors, we have lost our way. We want to capitulate. Okay? We want to surrender. We want to yield to. We want to give in to the, the local culture that dominates our churches rather than what the Word of God says. And so the preachers... From, from time immemorial, okay, have always preached that they declared that the kingdom of God, that they, they always declared that the kingdom of God is at hand. Did you hear what I just said? They always declared that the kingdom of God is at hand. It amazes to me how modern day preachers, post modern day preachers, okay, never talk about the kingdom of hand, the, the, kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's baffling to me. Absolutely baffling to me, okay? Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And look at what he says. He says, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What, is that just too old-fashioned? Is that antiquated? Am I dating myself? Am I woke? That's what it says. Well, turn your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 8. And remember, I warned you, okay, in our text messages back and forth, I said, we were, we, by the time we get through 1 John, okay, we would have gone through, we would have gone through over 4,000 verses in the scriptures to unite and, and to integrate the concepts that are being taught throughout 
first John. In the book of Acts, in chapter 19, verse 8, he says this. He says, And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, the apostle Paul, and reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Not only that, but they announced, they, the, the, all these preachers, they announced the merciful and the gracious of availability in of, of the king of the divine forgiveness. <clears throat> they announced the merciful and gracious availability of divine forgiveness. I don't know why we don't do that anymore. That's confusing to me. Hmm? Turn your Bible to Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. And it says, Of him all of the prophets bear what? They bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins receives forgiveness of sins turn your bibles to ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 and it says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses our iniquities our sins according to the riches of his grace our preachers of yesterday, they would urge sinners to be reconciled. They would urge sinners to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. We don't seem to do that anymore. I, I guess from, from the feedback that I get is that we don't want to offend anybody in the church. Well, I got news for you. Every time somebody walks through the door of a church and sits down and a real true born-again preacher opens up the book, okay? Every time a, a, a true preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a true teacher of the word of God, he, he already understands that the moment he asks the congregation and everybody that comes in there, okay, open up your Bibles, okay? The moment he does that, he knows this word is going to be offensive to their flesh. It's going to be offensive. Offensive to their humanity. It's going to be offensive to their humanness. It's going to be offensive to their thinking. I already know that in advance. Now I don't have to. I don't personalize the issue. Hmm? I don't personalize. I mean, we we don't have the luxury of doing that. Hmm? But we we have to urge sinners to be reconciled to God through the person of Jesus Christ. There is no other medium. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at this in verse 18, 19, 20, 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 19, 20, 21. And, and, and look what he says. He says, now all these things are from God. Not from the preacher. Not from the church. Not from the denomination. Not from the religion. He says, now all these things are from God. He says, who reconciled us to himself through Christ through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors, all of us, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when the Apostle John wrote this particular epistle, listen to this very carefully. When the Gospel of John wrote this very epistle, the incipient Gnosticism, the incipient Gnosticism was already threatening the churches of Asia Minor of that day. That's 2,000 plus years ago. Its proponents denied the full deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ, and therefore his true essential. Therefore, the true nature of uh, uh, the true, his true nature essential of to the gospel. If you can attack the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ, you can attack the gospel. If you can attack the gospel, then you can attack the issue of sin. You can attack. You can attack the issue of salvation. It's not necessary. That's, that continues today. That, that is alive and well today. Houston, we have a problem in the church. Listen to me. And those people at that time, those false teachers, those false teachers, they further claimed, okay, to have attained apart from the gospel. They claim apart from the gospel to have attained a transcendent, a, a, a transcendent knowledge, okay, 
a transcendent, I'm sorry, a transcendent knowledge of the divine. Available only to the spiritual elite. Only to the spiritual elite. Otherwise beyond the reach of the common believer. Otherwise beyond the reach of the common believer. That's where we're going to start taking off on these issues from this point forward. And we're going to pick this up in our next class.